Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate that. Um, I'm honored to be here today. But before I got here, a couple of weeks ago, I got a call from Dr. Curtis Chastain. When your doctor calls you, you know, you, you, you begin to worry a little bit. So I didn't call him back. He called me again. So finally, I said, I called him. I said, hey, Doc, it's Tony. How can I help you, man? What's going on? He said, Tony, you're a lawyer, right? I said, well, yeah, Doc, I'm a lawyer. He said, uh, you believe in the Constitution? Well, I thought he was talking about Obama with the debt ceiling and all that. I felt kind of proud then. I said, well, yeah, I believe in the Constitution. He says, what about that part, the First Amendment? He said, I'm supporting that. He said, the part about freedom of speech? I said, all the way. He said, good, I need you to give a free speech on August the 20th for the men's health program. <laughs> so I'm here, Doc, to give that free speech. I know, and I was listening to Phil Rainier as he summoned out the guys who've been here for 10 years and all the way down to one year. I know that three years from now, you will not remember who the guest speaker was this year. But you will remember if my speech was relatively short. So I plan to make the speech short so that you can remember me in the next three years. But at this time, I think we should thank Phil Brantley, the entire crew, the sponsors, the Team Blue folks, and all these folks who put this together and brought all of us together for this Men's Health Conference. Let's give them a look. <laughs> and speaking with you today, I was thinking about it the other day, and I, it came to me to say to you that your health, your health will present you with one of three situations. You will either be in a storm, coming out of a storm, or headed into a storm. And that storm may be your health, a loved one's health, or someone that you know. And what I mean about in the storm, you may be going through a traumatic health problem. Two, you may be coming out of that, or you will be headed into a storm. And we're going to concentrate today about how, as Dr. Chastain put it, to prevent you from headed, heading into another storm. A good friend of mine, Dr. Albert Sams, would always tell me, he said, Tony, know your numbers. Know your numbers. I said, man, what are you talking about, know your numbers? Well, he's talking about your blood pressure, my blood pressure, my cholesterol, and my blood sugar. And if you know those three numbers, and you keep those numbers in, ch in check, you will prevent that trifecta, because as Dr. Curtis Chastain would tell you, if those three get out of whack, you start spiraling downward. So knowing your numbers, have become or has become a mantra in my household, in my brother's household, and all of the men that are associated with me. So you must know your numbers. So how do you do that? How do you bulletproof yourself? If you read all the literature, it tells you with diet, exercise, and regular doctor visits. This Sunday, Dr. Sandra Gupta will be doing a special called The Last Heart Attack on CNN. It's going to be a great show. You should watch it. I've read up on it before it airs, and it will say in a weird kind of way that heart attacks are foodborne. Dr. Chastain may or may not agree with that, but it makes sense. Heart attacks are foodborne. I remember my school teacher would tell me, you are what you eat. I never knew what she was talking about. Well, at 48 years old, she's, make, she's making a point, or a point has been made. But Dr. Sandra Group, the special, will, will center around that don't eat anything that, had, that has had a face or a mother. <laughs> Don't eat anything that has had a face or a mother. I guess that leaves carrots and, and, and carrots and cabbage and stuff like that, but listen to it and it will tell you exactly how we must deal with it. My grandmother would always tell me, and I wrote it down, she would say, talk about the body being a temple. She would tie it into the Bible, but she would always tell, tell us that your body must be tough enough to fight, tender enough to cry, human enough to make mistakes, humble enough to admit them, strong enough to absorb the pain, and resilient enough to bounce back and keep on moving. In other words, if you don't take care of our bodies for ourselves, then we must do it for our children and our loved ones. Whatever situation you find yourself in, in life, if you have good health, you would enjoy it all the better. At this point, let me 
take a matter or a point of personal privilege to tell you about two young men who grew up similar in life. You see, as Judge Laverne told you, I, I hail from the great city of Plaquemine, but I grew up in a little town called Addicts. And I'm going to tell you about a young man who was similar in age with me, but who grew up in San, Fran San Francisville. I didn't know him, and he didn't know me. But I'll tell you that throughout the course of our lives, it was being parallel, and at one point, our roads would cross. You see, we both grew up with families, young African-American men, with a strong nuclear family. I having a strong grandmother, and so did he. And, and when we were in high school, I was lucky enough to be the class, senior class president. When he, when he was in high school, one of his main teachers in the latter 70s, early 80s, came up missing. She was dead, the founder. They never saw who killed one of his teachers. Fast forward to 1998. 1998, I was lucky enough to be appointed by the Supreme Court to be one of the youngest judges in the state of Louisiana. 1998, his neighbor, Randy Mebero, neighbors walked by and saw her three-year-old son wandering around the yard. They went in and checked it out. She was stabbed to death, beaten to death. Her murder was linked to him by DNA. In 2002, when I was prosecuting cases over in West Baton Rouge Parish, there was a young lady by the name of Gina Green off of Sanford Avenue who was found dead around the LSU area. DNA linked it back to this person who happened to have been relatively the same age, looked like me, about 35 miles away from me. Later on that year in 2002, lady by the name of Geraldine DeSoto over in Addis, where I was born, and where I was raised, was found dead in her trailer. There was a young man in January of 2002 knocked on her door. Knocked on the door, she answered the door, and he said, can I use your cordless phone? She said, no problem, she closed the door. That was at 11.41 a.m. At 11.41 a.m., she was on the internet. At 11.42, she logged off. At 11.44, she opened the door to hand him the call his phone. At 11.45, he placed a call to his job, his previous job, Exxon. At 11.46, that call ended, and all hell broke loose at that point. He knocked back on the door to give her the phone back. He pushed himself into that house, that trailer, and when he, walked, when he pushed himself in, she broke out running toward the back, knowing that that was a shotgun by their bed. Unbeknownst to her, her husband had unloaded the night before. She got to that shotgun. He closed behind her. She grabbed the shotgun. He took it from her. And when we walked in after the crime scene, you can see scratches on top of the trailer where he commenced to beat her with her own shotgun because it didn't have any bullets with it. She was a young lady who was in graduate school at LSU. Hail from a Vols Parish. She was a pretty good basketball player, pretty good athlete. She broke away from him. As she broke away from him and tried to run to the door, he grabbed her by the back of her head, and he popped her two times with his pocket knife in her left lung, right lung, strike that. She breaks away from that, and she heads to the door. At that time, he grabs her by the hair, and he cuts her throat from ear to ear. In an effort, still fighting, to put back so she can breathe, she takes her hands like this to try to connect her throat and her head back together. He stomped her as she fell to the floor. We come in hours later the prosecutor's office. I'll never forget that day. I walked in, I saw those hands like that. We knew then we had a serial killer floating around Louisiana. So what did we do? We scraped her fingernails. We took her fingernails because we figured maybe her fingernails were there, maybe she scraped the guy who did this to her. We took the DNA from her fingernails, and it was overwhelmingly her DNA. And so we had to come up with this concept. That was a concept from a live gene out of New Orleans called YSTR. Had never been done before in the world, but this scientist down in New Orleans, Louisiana Metairie, said that he can extrapolate the Y chromosome and we can take it and we can match it to any and other known DNA by this person. That was a young lady by the name of Danae Colon, Pam Kinnamore, Charlotte Murray Pace, as well as Carrie Yoder. We had DNA that matched that guy that was related to all of those young ladies' murders. We took the YSTR, the Y chromosome, from that crime scene. It came back to her dad. Why? 
because that was her daughter. Also, the Y chromosome of her husband. And for those of you, the Y chromosome is the male chromosome. And lastly, that was a Y chromosome of an unknown male. And it had a special allele to it. Allele is loci. That's when the, the DNA has its little special markers on it. So we took that YSTR of that person and we matched it with Danae Colon that we had matched one in 400 trillion, that it was Derek Todd Lee. And to the other ladies, one in 500 trillion, that it was Derek Todd Lee. And guess what? We got a match. Y chromosome from Geraldine DeSoto body matched Derek Todd Lee. Our paths were about to meet. These two young African-American males who grew up some 40 miles away from each other, our paths was about to cross. One, who tried to honor himself, go to school, and work hard, and the other chose a life of sucking the life out of other folks' children. It tells you, in essence, that there's a path, and I'm going somewhere with this, and I'll bring it to a head as I move on with it. Fast forward. We were able to convict him, and the jury convicted him of that, those charges, and it, which laid the foundation for Baton Rouge to ultimately prosecute him and give him the death penalty. And I say that to say this to you that I probably have the worst job and the most stressful job that most men can have. Because what I do for a living, I prosecute young men. I have no and make no qualms about it because when you forfeit, when you take the life of another person, you forfeit the right to walk around with the rest of us. So I make no apologies for what I do. I will continue to do it. And I will fast forward from there to a situation of one of the probably the most memorable murder trials, and I've done hundreds of them. But I will never forget this murder trial, because this murder trial took place last November, and it had probably a profound effect on me. This was the case, some of you may remember, of John Snyder, who threw his girlfriend off that four-mile bridge between Croc Springs and Point to Peak. You see, old John Snyder was a stairwart buff, all on pills and all that stuff. He and his girlfriend got into a fight at the Croc Spring bar. She left out of that bar, he grabbed her by her hair and threw her into his little truck. As they rode across that four mile bridge, he punches her and knocks blood all over the side of the window. He stops the car, she tries to fight him back, she jumps out of the truck, she's on that four mile bridge. She runs around the truck, she ducks the car, she gets on the railing and she's running for freedom. And guess who's behind her? Oh, John Snyder's behind her. It's just he and her on that bridge. He grabs her by the shirt and by the neck and you know what he does? He tosses her over the bridge over to her death. And when he does that, he leaves her there. The next day, there's a bunch of, three days later, the people are looking all over for her. He goes on the Lafayette News, the spokesperson, please help me find my girlfriend. I don't know where she is. Please help me. They are mounted up on four-wheelers, horses, and they're looking all over the Crocs being area for that young lady. Finally, he whispers to one of his buddies, go look under the four-mile bridge. That buddy testified against him. Go look under the Four Mile Bridge. We go under the Four Mile Bridge. There she was, possums, raccoons, and animals eating off her. The body had begun to, to decay. Well, that case came to trial. And it was one of the toughest trials because it was the only eyewitness out there was him. We start the trial. The defense lawyer and I, he didn't like me, and I didn't like him. So we commenced to try in this case. The whole while the evidence pointing at John Snyder. The whole while with me, I'm pumped up and I'm ready to bring it to him because I want justice for this family. The courthouse was packed. We get to the closing argument to wrap that trial up. After he finishes closing argument, I get to do rebuttal. And I get to tear him up because he tore me up about the state and circumstantial evidence, etc. But when I got up to do my closing argument, men, my pressure, I was just boiling mad. I stood up in front of that jury, and as I started to strap it on him, my left eye became engulfed with blood. The blood was so I couldn't even see out of it. The jury couldn't see the blood because it was internal. And I said to myself, self, not only has this son of a gun done killed this girl, this son of a bitch done killed me too. <laughs> so I grabbed hold to the podium, and I knew that if I were to fall out there, he would probably get another trial, and I also knew that life would go on. I mean, in that short time span, I knew life would go on. Another prosecutor would come up here, and Tony Clayton would just be a blip on the radar screen. So I grabbed that podium, and I knew not to start an argument, because if I did so, I think I'm having a stroke, and it may become worse. 
So I looked at the jury and I said, you know what? I don't have to say anything to y'all. Do whatever y'all think y'all need to do. Well, that stopped the case. That meant the jury got to make a decision no matter what happened to me. I walked back. The head DA was sitting next to me. I said, do not make a scene. Follow me out. I have something to tell you that's very important. He follows me out. The judge is reading the instruction. We get outside. I said, rush me to the hospital. I think I'm dying. And I said, take me now. So I called my wife when he was driving me to that Pointy P hospital. And I said, baby, meet me at the hospital. I didn't think she was going to bring my nine-year-old son. So, and I knew it was over because the blood was still rolling. And he says, what's wrong? I said, you don't, you're not going to believe this, but there's something going on in my brain. There's nothing but blood all over the place. It's due to kill me. We get to the hospital. They take me to the emergency room. They run me through a CT scan. When they ran, ran me through that CT scan, as I came out, man, they had to pass by the small little hospital. They had to pass by the waiting room. And what I saw when I was coming out of there and they had me all strapped up was my nine-year-old boy's face plastered against that window looking at me with a blank stare. And I had then realized that I did not bulletproof myself, that I had not protected myself. And in essence, I had not protected this nine-year-old boy who I brought into this world. And that look between he and I, he knew at that point in time, and I knew then, but I can tell he was like, I might not have my daddy again. And the only eye I had left, folks, I cried out of that one eye like I couldn't cry before. And I ultimately got back and I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed with a vessel that had burst in my eye. You see, the vessels that burst in your eye, or the vessels in your eye are some of the smallest and the weakest. They're the first to burst. Luckily, it burst there to relieve that pressure, because had it done so in my head, I would have suffered an aneurysm. I immediately went and found Curtis Chastain. And now I know my numbers. I'll tell you now, a month ago, my cholesterol was 225. A week ago, it was 144. I'll tell you that my blood pressure is 125 over 79. I know my blood sugar is 106. I know my numbers. I know my bad cholesterol was 172. Now it's 97. My good cholesterol was 29, now it's 33. I had a 6 to 1 ratio prior to that. I have a 3 to 1 ratio now, and I'm going to make it a little better, Dr. Chastain. But I'm telling you that you've got to bulletproof yourself because even a Tony Clayton, who a so-called judge, a so-called lawyer, a so-called prosecutor, you're not immune to it. You're not immune to it. But I'll tell you even more so that as I look across this room, and I see me. I see me now, and I see me later. But I agree with Phil Rainier that Baton Rouge is at the top of the country as it comes to this. Let me give you some stats that the Center for Disease Control has come out with. Unhealthy weight gain and poor diet, 300,000 deaths per year. One out of four deaths in Louisiana is attributed to heart disease. 10,026 Louisianians died from, died from heart attacks in 2006. 2,195 Louisiana died from strokes in 2006. 65.2% .2 adults are overweight in Louisiana. 33.7% are diagnosed with high blood cholesterol, and one-third of all deaths in Louisiana are due to cardiovascular disease. Now, I'll say to you, how do we bulletproof ourselves? You set goals. I remember when I got out of law school, I set a goal to make my first million dollars within five years of practice. I met that goal only to pay all that money back the next year in taxes. But the bottom line is, you got to set goals. You must drop the oil out of your diet. You must drop the grease, the fried food, back away from it. I went to lunch with Dr. Chastain and Judge Laverne the other day. And Judge Laverne is 73 years old in the epitome of health. Dr. Chastain ordered baked fr fish. Luke ordered four pieces of fried chicken. And he just, <laughs> so the bottom line is you can't do, you don't have the DNA of a Judge Laverne. I submit to you that you got you to gotta be careful with it. And Phil Rennell, you talked about prostate. Let me tell you, Dr. Chastain is my primary physician and my friend. And let's, I'm going to just deviate a little bit and tell you about my prostate exam with him the first time. <laughs> Folks, bear with me with this, and I might need a little help from you. But as I walked in that office, and I was told to drop it and get ready for it, I started hallucinating. 
sweat started popping from the palm of my hand. And in my mind, I thought I saw two nurses doing the doo-wop in the background. <laughs> and then I see this little white man comes in, and I just bent over to get ready for this horrible. And folks, in my mind, I thought this little white dude voice changed to a deep baritone. And the lights went down, and I thought he started singing, Lou Rawls, you'll never find. <laughs> Help me with this. Another love like mine, someone who cares about you. And I said to myself, self, that must be. In wrapping this up, folks, there's, those of you have flown on an airplane. It's not about you. It's about your children and your loved ones. And if you've ridden on a plane or flown on a plane, the flight attendant tells you that in the event of cabin pressure loss, the oxygen masks will fall. Place the oxygen mask on yourself. If you're seated next to a child, then place it on the child. Place the oxygen mask on yourself first, then assist your child. Well, I thought that was somewhat backwards. But they're right, because if you can't breathe, if you can't function, if you've had a stroke, if you can't support your family, then how can you help someone else? So by helping yourself, put the oxygen on yourself, bulletproof yourself, and then you will be able to help your loved ones. And in closing, I say to you, as you journey through your lives, remember that each step you take, everything you do, will affect the lives of others who are looking to you for guidance. Be that person who leads others toward a healthier life. Be an example to your friends. Take the hand of a child in need of a mentor and show him or her how to dream how to achieve, achieve the same health awareness attitude that you have. We can make Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and yes, America, a healthier place through sharing our hearts with those around us. And remember, genetics you cannot control, but how they affect you and your loved ones, you can by bulletproofing yourself. And the first step you should take to bulletproof yourself is to know your numbers. Thank you, and Godspeed.